I have a, a scathing editorial by the executive director of the Vermont Police Association. Who is the executive? About? No, it's no. Mike Hall. Oh, Mike Chief Hall. Of Manchester Police. Mike, wasn't Mike Hall uh, an SIU? No, person? Mike. Mike was is the was the chief of police. He's retired chief of police in Manchester Police. Manchester Vermont Police Department. Mike says that basically to sum it all up, I just don't care about victims. Well, there, there. I have talked to some police who say that the, the there are so few people in that position that, and they are the, for the most part, the people who deserve to be in, in prison. That I mean, that's I think that's the um, position of a lot of law enforcement is that. But the, 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 but the, the bill as amended. It's hard to see how they would make that argument mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not, I said this the other day, it doesn't get rid of life without parole. It just limits life without parole to, to the most egregious cases, which are the ones that they're referencing. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Well, I think, uh, we had that list. I can't find that list. Was it not given to us or was it just him? Which sort of was handed around about the 16 people. Oh, names. yeah, we did get that. But names, names people? Yeah. Um, but I can't find it in here, so I don't know. If it, was. it was the 16 people because um, I know that the two of them. 16 people who are life without parole? Mm -hmm, yeah. I think that's what it was because um, Robin, what's her name from Townsend, is one of them. And um, because she shot two people. And oh, the elderly woman. No, no, no. This is um, Randy uh, Lott, um, Steve Lott. Isn't that his first name? And his son. She oh. shot him. No, no, no. The elderly woman. I don't think she is. No, I know who you mean. Yeah. But anyway, we had that list, and I can't find it. Do you know where it came from? I so I, I have a list. I asked DOC for a list. Oh, and you just passed it around and looked at it, right? So it's, yes, because, okay. you know, uh, the Defender General's office said that it might not be accurate. I didn't yeah, know. that's true. Uh, but I do, I have a list in my email. I can send we, it. No, I don't, I don't really care. I was just thinking that, um, about the people that were on there. They were all convicted of aggravated. I don't so think so. In 19... 87, the Vermont Senate rejected a bill that would have created a death penalty. Mm -hmm. 21 to 8. Um, with Bloomer, Crowley, Goodnick, Corrigan, Alusi, Manchester, Morris, and Smith voting in the negative, which in the negative was to. Is that John Bloomer? No, yeah, John's father. And in the negative to do. To negative not. was to have a death penalty. Oh, no. the, those that are voted in the affirmative, the committee evidently voted it out five no, negatively. Aluzi was the spokesperson for the death penalty. Had a few remarks, and I'll ask Peggy to print these up for everybody. It's very interesting reading. Those senators that voted in the affirmative against the death penalty were Baker, Bongarts, Carter, Conrad, Dean, Delaney, Doyle, Finn, Garner, Hoff, Hunter, Ketchum, Little, May, Mazza, Parker, Racine, and Rolibud, Skinner, Spaulding, and Webster. Were you really? No. Uh, this was 1980. Did, did I part of that conversation? Edward Grant and I, he was a prosecutor in the no, Grand Eye is not listed on this vote. Webster, was that the Webster <clears throat> from Orange County? I believe so. But they, they both Skinner and uh, explained her vote, and Welsh was presiding that day. Interesting. See, uh, um, the testimony against it included the last prosecutor who convicted somebody. Yeah, that was a DeMag case. 
should look up. Sure would. Dave Demet? Yeah, I First believe he was the one that was electrocuted the final one in the 1950s. But then Vermont's, when the Supreme Court ruled that Vermont, Vermont's death penalty back then was ruled to be unconstitutional sometime in the 70s. So then they, uh, but the interesting thing, and I, again, I'll have it made up. Um, that was 87, you said? Yeah, 1987. So it was 82 that there was the same discussion was going on, and that yeah, prosecutor that came to give testimony. Yeah. Pretty powerful stuff. Because he but she said, what happened this is Mary to Jess Skinner, who was then the chair of this committee. Yesterday, I signed out legislation calling for the option of a life sentence without parole for first degree murder. So that's the genesis of the laws that we have now. Evidently, at that time, we didn't have any life without parole laws. So, first degree, is that what we would now call um, aggravated, or did no. they not have Ren, aggravated you, then? Sorry. And just, uh, Peggy, if you could have copies yep. made of that for yep. everybody. And, Probably the audience would like them. But John Bloomer, our secretary, uh, was able to find those in our journal and made copies for me. It's very interesting reading. It's both Lucy and Skinner had good arguments both ways. But obviously, Lucy lost again. But that's the genesis of, of what we have today. So. What draft 2.1 evidently calls for? I have 1.2. Is there a draft 2.1? I have. I have 2.1. Dated 2.12. Oh, yeah. Here we go. I have. And, um, so what we've done is taken away the life without parole for first and second degree murder, right? Yep. And kept it for aggravated murder. Yep. And to be aggravated murder, you have um, a whole bunch of things that have to be met, any one of which, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have that list here? Mm -hmm. Let me do it. Can you get that for the committee? Yeah. Want to have a, take a look at that? Yep. <clears throat> the factors are to be aggravated. We do have it here someplace. It's in one of your drafts. But yeah. If you'd like, I can just print out the. It would probably be helpful to it have. It, it's on. It's oh, on yeah. Draft aggravated murder. Two. I'm sorry. Yeah. Three. It's Never mind, Brent. It's okay. in 1.2. Aggravated murder to find. Page three. So, what would still be allowed to be charged? If the person were convicted of aggravated murder, they would still serve a life sentence. Without parole. Without parole. So what I, one of the things I wanted to hear was how hard it is to um, reach these, this, how high the bar is. Because if, it's, if, we, if we're going to end up with more prosecutors charging aggravated murder because they can reach this, I mean, is that likely to happen where they might not have before? Because I, I would like to know how hard it is to, to get to one of these. Um, Maybe the question would be how rare is it? Well, how rare is it now, but how, but if, if there isn't, if there is not life without parole for anything other than aggravated murder, are they more likely to then charge aggravated murder and be able to get to that Thank you, Peggy. Um, so that they can get life without parole. I guess that's my question. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Pepper could try to answer. I, well, yeah, I don't Pepper, know that he's neutral. Department, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs, a lot of these aggravating factors are purely factual questions. Um, and so if we're going to bring a charge, we have to have probable cause for every element of that charge. Eventually, we have to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt. But we can't charge, a charge won't stick. You know, a, ju a judge will dismiss a charge or require us to drop a charge down if we don't have at least probable cause for every element. So if you just take any one of these aggravating factors, uh, the person, the first one, um, the defendant was in custody under sentence for murder or aggravated murder, 
we would have to show that the person had was actually in custody mm -hmm. under DOC's custody and then committed the murder while they were under custody. And if we don't have at least probable cause that the person was in DOC custody, but it, you know, it's a purely factual question whether uh, mm -hmm. the person was in DOC custody. Okay. You can prove, I mean, it's, you can put on enough evidence at arraignment to say that this person was in DOC custody. And DOC custody includes probation? Yes. <coughs> so, I mean, it, a lot of these things are factual questions. You know, there's one that the victim of the murder was known by the person to be a firefighter. You know, you could put on evidence that the person was a firefighter in their uniform, performing their duties, and that that gives kind of notice to the, that the defendant knew that he was a firefighter. You know, but that, that is a little bit more nebulous whether, you know, but as far as probable cause, it's somewhat of a low bar for a state's attorney to put on sufficient evidence to establish probable cause. But that's just the charging element. One, you know, once reasonable you, doubt. Reasonable, reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt, for it would have to be, you'd have to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt to get, to get a conviction. Okay. And was performing his or her official duties, right. so. Oh, and was performing. Yeah, so it, it isn't just it isn't that just I knew you were a firefighter and I shot you. You had your uniform on and I shot you. Were, yeah, you were, had your uniform on. You know, the state's attorney would have to show that, you know, the person had the uniform on, was responding to a call, you know, there's a fire truck there, there was, you know. Not about the or. <coughs> or. It's this, I guess, the last part that modifies all of that. Yeah. Maybe not the best wording. Well, but I think that Anne was performing it refers to all of them. You know, the firefighter sure that was the intention. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot of these, again, are just purely factual. You know, the person was killed multiple people. You know, that as far as charging that, you know, the prosecutor would have to have sufficient evidence that there was multiple people. But it's not, a, it's not, a, you know, for probable cause, you know, it's not like there's a lot of wiggle room there, you know, to, if, if there weren't multiple people, then the, and the prosecutor couldn't charge aggravated murder just to plead, plead it down um, if they don't meet these, if they don't have the least probable cause for every element. What's number four? How do you, the defendant, knowingly created a great risk of death to another person? Somebody comes in here and shoots and hunks me. Hunk somebody out the window by their hand. Well, they shoot me, but they... Do they knowingly? Um, <coughs> what if they set off a bomb and it kills Alice, almost kills Joe? Or they come in here and shoot me, but <coughs> put everybody else here at risk because they. If they light a house on fire and there's. I don't think that would do it. No. Okay. I, I think it would have to be that they 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 knowingly created the situation. Like where a fire or a bomb would okay. reasonably assume that another person might copy. Okay. Yeah. Are you yeah. looking for yours? Well, I'm, I'm yeah. seeing you guys are looking at draft 1.2. Two, two, just to I'm get the list. We're just looking at it. This is, well, I'm looking at the element of, of, of the aggravated list. murder. Yeah. Is what we're trying to do. <clears> and I don't think you can forecast the yeah. behavior of. My guess is based on this drop poll that we get no bill if we don't have aggravated murder in because I'm not, I feel like I need to keep that alive to vote for it. Now it doesn't mean that we get to the floor and some, uh, I get rolled by an amendment that's pretty much the name of the game. But I just think, you know, given the testimony and all we've heard from the victim of the state's attorneys and getting the police association for a very misguided. I, um, Bryn, does, now I gotta go back to the bill, and I just put that in and make something else. Does the amendment in D on page five of draft 2.1, does that assure that <coughs> Gotta get the word right here. This is uh, um, Tyler, Skyler texted me. Uh, 
before the vote tomorrow, can we get clarification from what council or whether or not the bill allows for de facto life without parole? Meaning, uh, well, say you have a, a first degree murder, is not eligible for life without parole, but can they put on such conditions that it's de facto? Well, I think that the language in D applies only to the people who were 25 years of age or younger when they committed the offense or offenses. So that aggregate minimum to be served shall not exceed 35 years. That only applies to those people. So there are, um, there are situations where if a person uh, has received multiple sentences for multiple crimes and those sentences are imposed um, consecutively, then the person could be in prison sort of de facto life without parole. Wasn't there, am I remembering wrong? I thought there was a place earlier in the draft where it talked about concurrent. Yeah, so this is, this is the section. This is the, um, section two is the consecutive sentence. Um, this is the consecutive section. Right. It provides that one those sentences either consecutively or. And, and so the, the, the carve out is only for under 25. That's right. How, how often do the, they impose consecutive sessions? Sentence, cons consecutive sentences. That's not, I'm really not rare, isn't it? to answer that question. Uh, it would be, I mean, for instance, the wrong way driver on 89, he got concurrent sentences for the four workers. Concurrent, not concurrent. consecutive. Right. I mean, it's really dependent on the judge. For, for lesser crimes where a state's attorney might be seeking, you know, it might be seeking some additional supervision, you know, pre-approved furlough um, when there's two misdemeanor charges you know the, the judge might send some concurrently so that you can extend beyond the two years uh, for particularly for the supervision aspect um, but it's really dependent on the judge I see the one thing you know nothing to do with murder but it's possible to get a life sentence take made off for example you know with, with a oh, series of consecutive sentences, I think he's got 400 years, which is certainly de facto life. That isn't even a murder case, it's just the, the crime, the, you know, they felt it was so egregious. Um, well, again, I, I would go back to if I don't know how you prevent that unless you prevent it throughout state law. Well, what we've got now in terms of page five, um, I mean, to me, that's recognizing that you're at a young age and you're going to serve 35 years, and that should be the maximum. Mm -hmm. So I would be for just having it that way for everybody, um, because otherwise you do have the possibility that a given judge decides to have the sentences run consecutively, and then, in effect, you're you're creating just for murder or for everything. Well, the, I'm the thinking of Bernie Madoff. You know, if we make this just for murder, mm -hmm. you could have somebody who. Well, life without parole is what I'm. I understand what you're getting at, but I'm wondering how we encompass everything. Well, D is speaking to, is D just for murder? D just for murder. No, D applies to any, any uh, offense that an individual in 25 committed. Yeah, so it's everything. And I guess I, I'm going at it again from the perspective of if we're trying to get rid of life without parole, or de facto life without parole, then I would, I would prefer that the draft didn't set up other ways to get there. And it seems like the aggravated is one, and I understand the, the dynamics around that. This seems to be another where we're removing the possibility of life without parole for younger <coughs> offenders, but leaving it in place if somebody's 30, let's say. Yeah. The other thing, just to muddy the water still further, <clears throat> my memory is that the last time we discussed this, you, you indicated that, how 
I'm not sure if you were talking about the committee or yourself, but you said there might be some flexibility in the numbers, um, assuming we kept aggravated. Um, I don't know if you'd like to pick that up. I don't remember that. What do you mean the numbers? <laughs> you mean number the, the, I took it to be the minimum, <clears throat> the 35. Um, yeah, I, and frankly, I, um, I think we better arrange for testimony on this. I, I don't think we should do this. I mean, I don't want to have us have, last year, we, you're going to see an amendment to the S338. Last year, when we passed the escape thing for people on furlough, still my recollection that we did not agree that any escape from furlough would be, couldn't be prosecuted as an escape. I think we were under the impression that if it was an intentional act and they didn't intend to come back, that, but yes. after the Wheelock case, the Department of Corrections said, oh no, you can't charge anybody with escape. And so, I don't want to have unintended consequences. I thought it was at the discretion of the commission. I did too, but evidently they're not reading it that way. So we're, we'll have an, we can talk about that later, but I just don't want unintended consequences of a decision like this that would, for example, if you had somebody um, 35 who had a series of egregious things I can't, I, only thing I can think of is made up. Hopefully it would never be in Vermont, to be tried by a Vermont court, but you know, I think it's perfectly appropriate, all the damage that he caused, and he spent the rest of his life behind bars. And that's not a murder, but you know, the, that's just me. Well, and again, to go back to what we said a million times, but Getting rid of life without parole doesn't put Madoff on the street. It just gives no. him a chance to make his case. I understand. Oh. And he is trying to get out. Yeah, he was trying to get out. <laughs> well, I know, but... Uh, it was funny because we were using him as an example. I guess I would argue that he, he can come under the provision and that's under the compassionate release provision and that's to be 38. <laughs> He could get out. Yeah, he, he could just Did get I actually pardoned. see that he pardoned somebody that made a donation? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He pardoned right up, right up the open. N not, nobody without any money gets pardoned. Well, I don't know about Bogunovich. He, he I, I guess the, he liked his hair or something. Right, right. He liked his Bogunovich. hair. The gov former governor of Illinois oh. that he pardoned. Oh, but you know what that's yeah. about? It's because it was Obama's Senate right. seat that he was exactly. Sorry. Right. So it's, it's all about Obama. It's, yeah. Oh, well, anyway, um, so <coughs> do you have an amendment that you'd like to offer and then we could ask Pepper and Matt and victims and others I, to testify on? I, so my, my amendment would be twofold. It would be to um, make D on page five apply to uh, without age restriction <coughs> so that sentences would need to run concurrently, and and you'd have to hit the the minimum, but then not beyond the minimum. They could run consecutively, but not over that minimum. Min, over that thirty-five yeah. years. Right. So you could said. have yeah. two years, two years, two years, yeah. two years. That would be fine. But you couldn't have a twenty-year, a twenty-year, a twenty-year. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other would be to um, change the minimum from thirty-five to a lower number. Rin needs to know the number, I think. Let's say 30. 30. Can you write that amendment and then we'll get it out to the people and schedule it? Do we have any time open this week? This week? Was that clear, Brent? Yep, 10.30 okay. to 11.30 on Friday. To tomorrow? Oh. I mean, this Friday? Yeah, I believe so. That sounds good to me. Uh, no, Senator Ruth and Senator Benning will not be here. Thursday and Friday. This Thursday and Friday? Yep. Tomorrow. will be here Thursday because I've told them I'm not coming to help car this week. Oh, good. So. He'll be here, but he won't be here Friday. He won't be here Friday. Ruth or Benning not here on Friday. Ruth not here Thursday. Okay. Well, I think then we need to schedule it after town meeting. We'll move next week, too. 
Oh, but they're not here on that Friday either. No, 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 no. no, no. This week they're not here. Tomorrow, tomorrow and I Friday. Am, I am not here next Friday. Oh, next I, Friday. I am here. Next. You're Friday the twenty seventh. You're here. Yeah. Oh, okay. I misunderstood that. <coughs> and yeah. all right. So, well, we may have time next. What? The we'll, Friday we'll the twenty eighth. We have. We're open. Okay, well, let's look at the schedule then. Because, um, Joe won't be here Friday the 28th. Joe won't be here Friday the 28th. The next two Fridays, Joe won't be here. If need be, would you be able to call in on a vote? Um, how do I say this? You might not want me. No, I do. Calling you on that vote. Um, no. I'm sort of locked into a no position on this. I know, subject, so. but I want you to be present. Okay. Well, both. Okay. Um, you can't call in the vote technically. Yeah, you, you're not supposed to do that. You can only vote if you're in the building. <sighs> it's a full scale jury trial on an aggravated side with a weapon that's like after murder, the next okay. one down the line. So right. can't, it's well, to get it. well be, that's fine. I mean, that's fine. Joe. That's fine. I don't want to push anything. We could be 3 1 1. We could be, I could leave. <laughs> okay. All right, well, we'll try to fit something in. If Bryn will get an amendment around it. We don't have to fill it right now. Do you want to move this to Friday and squeeze it in there on Tuesday? Yeah, that's a great idea, Peggy. I don't know how you're so great. <laughs> if, if she's available. Okay, let me check. Just so check potentially make sure. Tuesday at 11 we might do this? Yeah, but check with Rebecca. Rebecca to make sure she's available tomorrow morning on that bill. I mean, Friday morning on that bill. It's next. It's next Friday, so I bet yeah. she is. We're next Friday. Wait a minute. You've got me all. A week from Friday. <laughs> we so can't. No, do I don't. I don't want to schedule anything a week from Friday. The Friday, that Friday, I don't yeah. want to schedule anything yet because I need. That's our last okay. day before we leave on town meeting break, and I want to make sure that we get certain bills out. The expungement. I. Okay. We may need time to finish our work on the expungement bill that day. Okay, so leave as is and we'll- Leave as is, out. if okay. we have to, we'll deal with this bill when we come back. Oh, I thought we were doing this one Tuesday anyway, this coming Tuesday. No, not, because I thought <laughs> Peggy was moving her to fri this Friday on that other bill. The non-current traversal bill is gonna end up in appropriations anyway. Oh, I could try that, Senator Sears. I could try and move 205 to this Friday. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. And then move this, this must be exciting watching for to Orca, Tuesday. by yeah. the way. <laughs> Let me see I'm sure that they're that. just overjoyed at watching this thing. I don't know. Well, it does give people I can't, a sense of I can't promise. how complicated yeah, I know, but it is to try the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is complex. It's gotten worse. I mean, back when it was just. Yeah. Well, this committee does move more bills than most committees. That's true. Okay, so we're, we'll find a different time. Bryn will send around a copy to the interested parties and let them comment on that and uh, then take testimony on it. So there's quite a lot of curious. Is that going to have a reputation too? Well, Senator Sears has a reputation for being one of the most productive legislators in the country. When, when did you earn that award? Yeah, uh, number last six. Year. Mm -hmm. Number six with a bullet. Number six. You're number six in the country for getting bills out? Yeah. yeah. Most productive state most center in the country. Is there a, a, a list for those who introduced the most bills? Or you no. <laughs> Gina. <laughs> well, it's introducing bills of consequence of having the past. There's an algorithm that they use nationwide. Uh, I came in number six in the United of the all state centers. I, Maintained if it wasn't for Ann Pugh, I'd been number five. Getting the past art for you to beat Alison Clarkson, she's on a million bills. Yeah, but it's getting bills of consequence. Yeah, and then it's getting them 
passed into the yeah. law. Make me feel bad, you know. As chair of a committee, I can only got like two or three bills on the wall in comparison. That's all you're I can't live up to Dick's reputation. Mazel only has one bill. Try it. Well, actually, he has two, but he, yeah. he won't get me through. <laughs> oh, the other one. <clears throat> um, just so you know, on the floor, if, if this gets to the floor, I'm, I'm going to be a no vote. I'm not going to make any speeches. But I want you to know I'm sort of locked into this from a political. I'm not sure there's a thing to the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go on. We've got a two minute a short break because we're waiting for 234 and miscellaneous bill. Oh, do we have time to just run down to the other, my other committee and get, grab something? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Thank you hey. for being here, Eric. Absolutely. Happy to be here. All right. We have a uh, amendment regarding a, I don't know if I'd like to reinstate the fee holiday. But, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better term right now, maybe somebody can suggest a better term. This amendment would propose establishing a month. Um, this amendment would establish it from September 1 to did you change the amendment after you and I had the conversation? No, I, I think we said let's hold off on it for now and okay. then see um, kind of where, where that. This would allow people to. Well, why don't you hand it out? Oh, does everybody have it? No? The, uh, does everybody have it? Yeah. My yeah. copy's like this. What what folder is in it? What? What folder? 6.1. What, what, what's what's the number? Which bill? It's S234. Should be a version oh. 2.1. Oh, I don't think they're I don't have two points. This is the only thing I have. I think. Okay. This, this is called Judiciary Procedures. Is this what you're doing? It's in the folder. Yes. What, what the bill number is that in? I'm sorry. Section 29 is that what it is? Is this it, Eric? Uh, Why does that do wrong? Oh, Judiciary Wait, Procedures. Wait, I hand There's two papers. I put it back in a different one. <laughs> I think. Is that a mistake? <laughs> Yeah, that's something else. I only have draft 1.1. I do too. Well, this one, I guess, I don't know where this piece of paper came from. Oh, this, but, this uh, piece of paper in our file. Yeah. Is that what you're looking at? Correct. Okay. Uh, this piece of paper. Oh, okay. But, but that does appear to be, but yes, that is the language to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is a good question. Where did it come from? I don't know the answer to that. It came from Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> Deep. Right. Oh, we're just wondering no. where this came from. Uh, okay. I'm assuming it came from David Sure, it is. No, you do have a meeting that you... Do you have another one, Peggy? It's in your folder. I gave it to oh. Eric. I don't think she has. I, I don't need one, Peggy, because it's the same language that's actually oh, okay, in, okay. The, in the... <laughs> that I have a clue. Well... So either way, yes, that language is... Yeah, we is what the copies of whatever that draft is your Okay. Let's go over this. Before we, out there, after. Let's stop the administrative. This is the same thing that happened with the last bill. It seems like we're lack of printer is messed up. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. So what are we, what's the draft number we're looking at? <laughs> just let's look at this for now. Alice, okay. let's just look at this. Yep, thing. looking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So this is a substantially similar as to what you said. You say Zenner's here was in version 1.1. The dates are the same for the moment, but it does establish, for lack of a better term at the moment, a reinstatement fee holiday program. So during that one month period, which of course is open to <coughs> amendments, but for now it's September of 2020. And during that period, it permits uh, a person to apply to the Judicial Bureau for reinstatement of their license if it's been suspended for a traffic violation. And if they apply during that 30-day window, during that one-month period, then all fees associated with reinstatement are to be waived, shall be waived. You see that in subsection C, middle line. All fees associated with reinstatement shall be waived. And that does give some illustrative language in the next sentence. Fees to be waived include DMV reinstatement fee, any fees imposed by the Judicial Bureau for failure to answer the complaint <coughs> or pay fees, and any surcharges imposed by the court. So you have this one month period during which you can um, apply for reinstatement. If you've been suspended as a result of a traffic violation, you can get your license reinstatement, reinstated, 
without paying any of these fees that would ordinarily apply. Now, look at subsection D under the, under the proposal, there is still a $10 um, fine associated with getting your license reinstated. So all the other fees are waived, but there is a $10 fee that is in connection with that. And my understanding is, and the witnesses can probably testify, but it's similar to the way when this was done in Chittenden County, there's, a, there's a, at least a, a, a nominal fee associated with it to cover any administrative costs that may be involved. I thought the court said that it would cost them more to, to administer this than the $10 that they'd be getting and that it was they did say ridiculous that. to have it there. I might be putting words in the court's mouth. I don't see no, the court's say that. <laughs> oh, oh, there you are. I thought that's what I heard. And last, the last piece uh, is an ed education notification piece. The idea here is obviously you want people to know about this program so that they can uh, go participate in it. So it requires the AG and Sheriff's of State's Attorneys and DMV to work cooperatively to notify and educate the whole public about the availability of the program. And this has to encourage, uh, uh, encourage applicants to check DMV records to make sure that um, the application for reinstatement covers each of the tickets that are associated with the person's operator's license. How do they do that? I'd have to check with DMV on that. That's my good I'm going to call up right now and get my DMV record checked. Seems, seems like there might be a lot more to that than just right. saying they can check it. <clears throat> so yeah. that's the proposal. I, I, I wish it, that it said um, except for section D as they start reading C because somebody might read that and they aren't going to read any farther <laughs> further you know where it says there are absolutely no fees and then yeah uh, there is a fee well there still is in here but I know well even if, but right now as this is written and yeah. as it is I think that you'd stop there and say great and then it turns out there is a fee yeah I think we should I'm, I'm with Judge Gerson on that I think we should get rid of that ten dollar well, I think we should probably listen to the testimony before we. Yeah. Um, there evidently is some opposition to this idea. To which idea? Huh? To oh, which right. idea? The $10? The whole, or the thing? whole, thing? The whole thing. thing. Oh, the whole thing, yeah. Where's the thing? Oh, we'll hear. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, Eric. Sure. Uh, Greg Mosley, Chief Finance and Administration of the Administration. Hello, Senator. There's an email here from you that I just opened that has your testimony. And I have some extra hard copies of that, okay. that memo if, if you'd like to have the hard copies now. Probably um, would. Okay. You don't have to keep it now or whatever you want. All of them, and then I have an, a, the original for the uh, staff. So, um, my name is Greg Mosley. I'm the Chief of Finance Administration for the Judiciary, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak on the uh, uh, Senate Bill 234 and, and the amendment. We need one more. If you have yes. Yeah. Well, have Peggy I'll, I'll use the uh, original, okay. and then I'll okay. give it to you afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk about S-234 and to relay some of our thoughts um, about this, um, this bill, in particular the amendment around the, uh, the fee holiday. Um, we have a, a number of concerns about how that would be um, uh, arranged. The biggest one being that we have 15,000 people who are currently in payment plans. And so their licenses are not suspended, and by definition, they would not be eligible for this fee holiday. And it would create a disincentive for people to comply with, um, with the uh, tickets in the DMV process. We also um, note that there are fees that would need to be, uh, that would be foregone revenue, and it impacts the judiciary along with a number of other agencies that receive um, the money from these different collections. Uh, so 
the judiciary collects a $12.50 per case administrative fee along with some late fees called failure to pay, failure to answer. It's essentially different versions of late fees. So per case, it would be about $62.50 uh, in foregone revenue for the court technology fund. But in addition to that, there are um, other funds that get um, some of this revenue, which include the um, transportation fund, the municipalities um, where the tickets are written, the uh, victim compensation fund, the domestic and sexual assault fund, um, and the general fund as well. So um, we haven't done a complete estimate on uh, on exactly how much revenue this would be. It would be based on how many people apply, of course. The other thing to mention is that um, the Judicial Bureau no longer has the accurate record of how many licenses are in suspense. DMV has that. Our records don't match. They're off by well over 100,000 um, different cases. And that's mainly because in 2016, um, an act kind of decoupled our two systems and people could reinstate their license without paying the underlying uh, violations, which meant that DMV would reinstate the license, that information wouldn't get to the Judicial Bureau and we would just show that that person's license is still in suspense. So the applications probably should not come to us because we don't know who's eligible and who's not. DMV has that information. What we have is the number of tickets per person. So. In this amendment, it says the applications go to the Judicial Bureau and that people are encouraged to call the DMV to find out how many tickets they have. Those roles re really should be reversed. Um, we can't reinstate licenses because we don't have the accurate list of who's in suspense, but we do have the number of tickets that are still outstanding. Um, we also... Um, we also found in the driver's license restoration program of 2016 that of the applica applications we received, only about half actually paid the fee. So um, the payment of a $10 fee uh, creates a lot of complexity in administering this program. Uh, we will have people who apply who then don't pay the fee. And what do we do with those folks? Uh, we also need to know where that $10 goes to. Does it go to the DMV, or does it go to the Judicial Bureau, or does it go to some selection of other uh, funds that would be negatively impacted by this fee holiday? Um, in 2016, only about 4% of the uh, eligible cases actually applied for that waiver. So right now, I understand that the number of um, licenses that are suspended is about 55,000. And I don't know exactly what percentage of folks would actually take advantage of this fee holiday, but it's likely to be a, a single digit percentage of that number. The application process would have to be well defined who's receiving the applications, what information is necessary. Um, the $10 fee, uh, there was mention uh, made of, of Judge Gerson's comments. The $10 fee would not even come close to covering the costs for the state's attorney and sheriff's departments for the marketing or the DMV or the Judicial Bureau for the processing and the waiving of, of um, the debts. And I think those are our major concerns with how this program would be implemented. Um, Can we go back to the lack of communication between DMV and the Judiciary or the Judicial Bureau? So you really don't know. Our records show that we have 155,000 suspended licenses. DMV shows 55,000. I, I, I'm looking at a DMV report that shows 95,285 individuals, 49,000 of whom have an address in Vermont. Yeah, I, I can't so speak I don't to them. I where the 155 comes from, or the 55. That, that was, that's whatever the date was that they looked at that. I think it was January 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. But we were, maybe this isn't a great idea, but the two things that are holding up many of these is the ability to when somebody goes through the diversion program and they set up a payment plan, who's the payment to? Judicial Bureau. The Judicial Bureau. But so 
Do you have the ability to waive the reinstatement fee for them? No. The, the ability to waive surcharges? Yes. The reinstatement fee is a DMV fee, so we don't, we don't uh, have any authority on that fee or where the money goes. So when somebody goes through the diversion program, they set up their own payment plan and they still can drive, right? Yes. <laughs> what kind of insurance do they have to get? I'm not sure if an SR-22. You have to get the SR-22 to drive. It depends on what the violation's for. Okay. Right. I think if it's just for um, not paying fines, it doesn't have to be SR-22. But if it's not DUI, necessarily an SR-22 is required. <laughs> Maybe a holiday isn't the best idea, but I, what we're trying to do is get the number of 49,000 reduced, and I don't know what the best idea is to get there. I, I what I'm hearing here from you is that to it'd be somewhat unfair to people that are making set up a payment plan to have a holiday for people who have not made any effort to get rid of their suspension that is our concern yes okay. I'll tell you one thing we could do to promote people doing this you know I went to um, had to go to uh, Department of Labor and Volk Rehab are both in the same place in Brattleboro. And I went over there and was talking to them. The people that work for our own state government don't even know about the diversion program and the fact that they can set it up. There wasn't one person at DOL or Volk Rehab that knew about the, the program and how they could do it. So if we just worked with our own employees to get, the, because a lot of the people that they're working with at Volk Rehab fall into this situation and they didn't even know anything about it so I think there are a lot of ways that we can um, educate people around the diversion pro that they can apply for the diversion program um, and anyway I was just appalled that so I'm going to one of their staff meetings to talk to them about it because and the same with economic services and all yeah, you know, just know. somebody with the fines can just walk walk into diversion instead of payment. They can they even can apply though diversion is not involved with them. So the, the payment plans that we set up at the judicial bureau aren't necessarily the diversion program. Right, but the diversion program is yes, people apply to the diversion program and they go in and they set up a um, I mean, they don't have to be involved in it. They don't have to be a client. No, no. They're, they're, they have, and there's a separate person in our diversion program anyway that handles this and that does it. But our state employees don't even, aren't even aware. I have a number of um, people who work for a particular employer down there who have, she got very excited about this because her a number of her employees were in the position of not being able to drive or they were driving taking a chance and they set them up and it's so we should educate our own state employees about one other thing um, that I should have mentioned was that we do have partial payments. So a lot of these people mm -hmm. that um, have suspended licenses may be eligible for this program, may have partially paid or we may have received a tax offset. And mm -hmm. so it would be important that this bill not require that all fees be um, uh, reversed because that would set up a situation where we're refunding money. Mm -hmm. What we prefer then is that balances be adjusted to zero. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions for Greg? Thank you for being here. Thank you. For me. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're happy to answer more questions as there they come up. There may be after Dave testifies or after Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning. 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 We have. Oh. You need to identify something. Pardon me? You need, you need to, to identify Oh, I'm sorry. From. I'm Dave Evans, uh, Chief of Driver Improvement, Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, we have approximately 55,000 people right now that are under suspension in Vermont for failure to pay fines. That number is, is fluid. Um, as I, if I were to run the number this morning before I came over, it would have changed by now. Uh, with people going under suspension, people reinstating, um, but uh, 55,000. Um, the department supports this initiative. Um, 
we, we feel it's important to get people back able to drive legally. Um, our, the implications this has on our department is the waiver of the reinstatement fee. Um, it doesn't create, although it will create a bubble of more work, over the long haul it doesn't create more work uh, because we would be, be reinstating um, people, on a, we reinstate people on a daily basis. So for a very short period of time while this is going on, we could see the numbers from the last time we did this um, didn't show a great impact. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, we had lists, and I think the highest day was 32 people were reinstated through um, this, this holiday, um, as few as five people some days. So it, it's not a great impact in that on the department, um, other than, you know, there would be a little bit more, more uh, coming in. I can't tell you lost revenue, because again, we don't know how many people are gonna take, uh, take part in this. Um, we, we'd be able to tell, of course, after the fact, but um, it, I, I don't think that it would be that high. Um, I know that one of the concerns we heard the last time we did this when they were requiring a payment of $30 per ticket to reinstate was that people couldn't afford it. Um, you're dealing with people that can't pay tickets, don't have a lot of resources, and if they have 10 tickets that are unpaid uh, at $30 a ticket, that's $300 they need to come up with. Uh, I, I think the $10 fee is, is uh, much more realistic, allowing those people who are vulnerable within our society to be able to pay off their tickets and, and become reinstated. When, when someone dies, do you get a notice that they're dead and they should no longer have a valid license? Or are some of these people, people who are dead, and you just don't know about them? They may, they may well be. Because um, do you get a we notice? We don't get notice. We don't get a notice. So. Um, many times a family will return mail to us indicating that the person has passed away. Or when their assets are dispersed, um, we'll receive a, um, a copy of a death certificate to transfer a title. Um, in that case, we would put that into our record, uh, but uh, the Department of Health does not notify us. What kind of notice do people get that their license has been suspended? They receive a letter. Um, One? Typically, yes. Do you send out a letter to individuals if their license has been suspended in another state? We do. And they would get that notice from they, they, our Department of Motor Vehicles? We would. Uh, we have reciprocal agreements with other and states. So if, if I owed, I don't know if any of these 55 cars On the day that the report was done, it was 49,000 for Mars. Of them, are any of them just because of an out of state? No, it wouldn't appear as an FAF suspension. Okay, would, so there may be, in fact, people whose, uh, whose license has been suspended by New Hampshire who would have to pay New Hampshire. Yes, that would be totally separate. These are just um, this, the number of people that's on the uh, report that we gave you are just people that are under suspension for not paying Vermont tickets. Okay. Um, so people should know that their license is suspended if it's been suspended. They should. Do you report this to insurance agencies or are they just looking on your database? They're looking on the database. Do you have a separate data breakdown for notices that you send out that come back to you as undeliverable? We save those. We image them um, when they come back. Do you um, know how many there are in comparison to that 50,000 number you just I, Off the top, I couldn't tell you. <clears throat> I know there's a number every day. Uh, people don't update their address with the department, and so we'll mail a suspension notice to a previous address. Um, and it'll be returned to us. Um, and there are other situations. The only reason I ask this is that I've got a client currently who is in an abusive relationship, left that relationship, and was living in a hotel. And um, in the interim, we got herself on some traffic violations. <coughs> we were wondering what happened because she claimed she never got notice of her license being suspended. Right. What we would do is, if we were provided with information after the fact, we would mail a, 
a notice to the new address of record. But if she hadn't given you that address, it would have gone to the last known address, which would have been the place where she That's left. correct. I'd be interested to see how you got that data available, what the number is in comparison to the 50,000 people that we're talking about. Sure, I, I can certainly try and get that number for you. But there isn't any follow-up at all to try to find an updated address. If we have it available, for example, if, you know, if, if it's a DUI, okay, and that this is the, the one thing that I, comes to my mind immediately, and we use the address of record, um, we will research that if it's returned to see if there's a different address on the application or, the, or on the, the paperwork from the DUI. Um, if there is, we'll mail it to that address. Um, many times that's the case. <laughs> follow up to Joe's question, Central Bank's question. Is your database accessible to the public or just to no. insurance industry? It just insurance industries. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. I hope they're paying for it. They are. They are. <laughs> A lot. Absolutely. Um, other questions? I, uh, the, the proposal here is for uh, the month of September. Uh, I'm curious if that would have an impact on, I believe it's October 1st that you have, you have to, you have to have in order to fly, uh, I get confused. Real ID? Real ID, yes. You have to have a real ID in order to fly. That's one with a little star on it, right? Yes. That I've got. Um, so, should it be, you know, like August? So the, the people could... If, if that's a concern, and I can see where that would be a concern, then I would agree with you. September probably would not be the best month. Allowing someone to reinstate and then allowing them to two weeks to get a, to a couple of weeks to get a, get a license, yes. Other questions for Dave? Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. Can yeah, sure. an individual call to see if they're like <laughs> Absolutely. We have a number of people that in our information unit that specialize in driver improvement. We have people call every day. What do I need to do to, to reinstate my license? Do I have any outstanding tickets? Um, that type of question. They're able to get that information off the phone. David Shaw. Thank you, Senator David Shaw, with the Attorney General's Office. Um, as the committee knows, we certainly support the concept behind this bill, and I think one uh, thinking out loud here a little bit in terms of how to move forward. Uh, one thing we might want to think about is actually being a little bit less proscriptive in the statute and allowing for the administrative entities to work out exactly how this is going to happen. Um, and a second issue, well, second issue that I heard about today, which I think is a reasonable one, is with respect to the folks with payment plans mm -hmm. essentially getting punished, if you will, for doing the right thing. I think that's a reasonable point. And I think that one thing we could do is make it easier for folks on payment plans to get out from under that as well it, for the sake of fairness. I realize we're sort of pushing everybody into the category of um, getting a really good deal, but if the point is to make sure that we are uh, reinstating as many people as possible, that may be a reasonable policy outcome and certainly I think one that we would support. The final thing that I would bring up, and I believe Judge Grierson mentioned something about this last time, was the idea of essentially taking out a lot of the process, and, and this would have to be something that uh, the court staff would weigh in on, um, not even having a fee at all and doing a sort of large scale, we know what the list is, uh, let's not have require people to come back. Uh, and affirmatively ask for the reinstatement and instead just do a sort of blanket reinstatement for people who meet a certain set of qualifications. Um, that would obviously be a much more dramatic thing and may uh, have some pushback, but uh, that is an option, I think, even though it's more dramatic, it may actually be a little bit simpler. 
but for the sake of moving forward, it may be easier to uh, have less detail in this, have a sort of set of range of dates and a goal, and let administrative agencies um, work through some of the details that were discussed today. And, and I'm happy to continue to be a facilitator on this and trying to get this. What if, this, this is Dr. Uh, Dr. Maya, so what if everything went through the diversion board and people went to the diversion board, the diversion board could make recommendations and then your people who are on payment plans, let's say I owe $800. I don't, by the way, my license is not suspended. The best of my knowledge. <laughs> Uh, I owe eight hundred dollars. I go to the. I have to go to the local diversion board. They rec make a recommendation to the judicial bureau or whomever, DMV, that we waive this, this, and this because of their financial situation. That would allow people who are already in a payment plan to not be treated unfairly and be less bureaucratic because they already know the source, the where they have to go. So if everything went through the local diversion board, you're, I don't, it would create a bubble for them, but it's a, a month where they could determine, you know, guy drove up here in a Cadillac, with, you know, his wife drove the Cadillac, and he got out of the car, and, you know, maybe he doesn't need it as bad as the guy who's riding a bicycle because he doesn't have a license. Um, I don't know, that's just off the top of my head, that everything goes through diversion that way. They already know who's in their program and who deserves to have, you know, yeah, I be think the filter. Because I don't want to see, and I hate, I hate to see, I didn't think about that until Greg testified that it is kind of unfair to those people that are currently in a payment plan. Mm -hmm. Would that be too bureaucratic? Could you check with your diversion? I can certainly check with the program. I, I, um, what, one thing that pops to mind immediately is that not everybody who's on a payment, payment plan will have come through the diversion program, so it's not as though that's sort of oh, an really? obvious. Right, people can figure, people can do it on their own if they. Through who? By just calling and working it out with the bureau. And do they get to keep their license during the period of time they're current on yeah. their contract? We take payments as low as $30. So it's the same thing long. except going through you instead of diversion. That's right. Well, maybe we should give, be giving them the ability to waive I mean, that is actually one simple fix that I believe was asked for already is right now they're not even allowed to waive that reinstatement fee, and I think that's the current proposal. Um, as a basic. Is that in the miscellaneous bill? Fix. I think that's, that's what I heard. That there's language in the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill that allows waiver of the grand state right. fee. Is that right? Yeah. It had been in law and then it was repealed for some reason. We don't know why. Huh. Um, and we realized that about six months ago. And I've been working to try and get it taken care of. Well, So that's one fix that hopefully will move forward regardless. Um, I think I'll check with the diversion folks and see what kind of workload they would uh, anticipate for that. Again, I don't think that that would actually get the full group here because a lot of, or at least some folks, are not going through. Well, uh, diversion. They have who's on a payment plan. They can notify them that they have that option. Now. Judicial bureau. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know who's on payment. I mean, right. they, could, they could say if you want to, you know, see if you can uh, go through the diversion. I mean, you know, it would just be fairer to allow everybody to, uh, right. it seems to me. Am I making sense? Yeah. Sometimes I don't know. I'm really thinking off the top of my head here how to get it done. It doesn't solve the out-of-state problem. And I'm not do sure where you can do, do that. Do any of you have that out of state? Do, do any of them pay off? You can't unsuspend a suspended license from New Hampshire, right? No, we can't. We would, um, if they paid, um, we would take their payment and notify Vermont, and Vermont DMV notifies the out of state agency. But they could be on a payment plan mm -hmm. or an out of state ticket? Uh, a Vermont ticket. You mean an out-of-stater? 
No, no, Vermont ticket. Vermont, somebody who has a Vermont license has been suspended because of violations in that New Hampshire. I keep using New Hampshire because that's where that word accident happened because Massachusetts DMP didn't notify New Hampshire, didn't notify somebody. Somebody could work a payment plan out, but you could not suspend. They'd have to just pay it to New Hampshire. We don't take payments for out-of-state tickets. We only, okay. we only take payments for Vermont tickets reported to DMV. So the person sends a check directly to wherever in New Hampshire, Concord, or whatever, and then they notify Vermont that the ticket is paid. Okay. All right. I can, uh, I, I will take it as my next step unless there's other recommendations to get back together with the main folks here and see if a solution may be to actually be a little bit Maybe less. He's asking about out of state. I think it's possible that somebody would have a license suspended from out of state and a license suspended for traffic tickets not paid for Vermont, and it all piles up on them and they. And for the out-of-state piece, I'm not sure how much we can control that. I think the best we can do is let people know that they have that issue. How much would it cost for DMV to notify everybody whose license is suspended that this was happening? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I could probably find it for you. Would it be over? 5,000. <coughs> would you say 5,000? I would, I would guess what he, when you send out a mass mailing, you're not... Yes. Is yeah, it's it's probably not, 10 or 15 cents. How would we, piece. how would people yeah. know right. who yeah. only reads Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they never read the, I mean, not a lot of people don't read newspapers. They're, all their news comes off of Facebook. As we know, some of it's not true. I saw an awful post about Phil I knew it wasn't true. I didn't try to correct. Only one? No, actually, a good so, example is, something like no, actually, a good example is yesterday there was an incident in a House committee room where a particular House member went off against an advocate who was in the room. And yet, because the woman has a good relationship with Senator Ash, she posted it as she was with Senator Ash. So it looks like Ash was in the room with her when this committee member from the House Michelle Bill knowing unnamed. If you look at Facebook, you can see that. Oh, this was about connected. cats? Huh? Yeah. But I didn't hear Skinning cats. Animal cruelty. Skinning cats? Skinning cats. Well, uh, uh, I didn't mean to get into this. On, on the record. Oh, on the record. You're on the record, but not taking the pellet. Yeah. Yeah. I went a little bit overboard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. At any rate, Ash wasn't there, but he's tagged in the Facebook post, so it looks like he was there. Nobody will be correcting that, I guess. That's where you get your news. That's where Mark Mark says, no, no, I'm not correcting anything like that. Right. It's political. Uh, so the could revenue we check on those three things and get back to this in, in a week? Yes. So we'll try to fill some time in. That Friday the 28th, and nobody will be here. Is there a fiscal yeah. ramification for the DMV? We took David's suggestion of a carte blanche forgiveness for all, or be ten times as many, probably. Everybody, right? Because I know there's one for the judicial bureau, but I don't know how much. Single digits who took them up on it originally. So if you just automatically did them, it seems like it would have to be by a factor. But it's certainly probably more than that. It's so weird you have to travel yeah. to to be a part of it. Yeah. Those locations. But I mean, it's just on the whole list. The dead people also. Dead people have feelings too. <laughs> Careful, that would go. I mean, that might be quite a number. Of dead people with feelings? Who are on the list. Oh. People oh. who are on the list that don't know they're on the list. That's part of the problem. Right. Yeah, but I don't know. I I'm not sure. Uh, if you have a suspended license, you know you're. Yeah, well, if you move, you don't. I mean, that, uh, 
this woman in my case. Well, oh, because of the address. Yeah. 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 Ye
the link for that. Yeah. Do you want me to, I can just speak to that really yeah, briefly. Please, please do. Uh, for the record, Dave with the, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. So the, Eric's right, the thinking is to mirror the two and the policy impact is that some percentage of people, even if they're sent to diversion, don't get it done and they end up with a ticket on their record and especially with marijuana tickets, they, and those are not expungeable, especially with marijuana tickets, those do have serious collateral consequences mm -hmm. for young people down the road and one area we hear about in particular is with attempting to enlist, mm -hmm. still a federal crime. Uh, consumption or possession of marijuana. So with the delinqu the advantage that the delinquency gives is that, that it has much better confidentiality protections. If the person messes up and doesn't do the stuff on time, they're still in the juvenile court world and it's not gonna get out of that world. There isn't gonna be a public notation on this. They will get a you know, they'll be put they'll be sent back to diversion, here, go do this. Or worst case scenario, they maybe proceed through uh, some sort of adjudication in juvenile court, although that's very unlikely. Uh, so it, it is a significant advantage to people in maintaining confidentiality, especially for, for young people who don't always follow deadlines as well as they should. And so the idea is to return that advantage to them that they already, that they had previously, and we believe was sort of accidentally taken out because people thought that that was the more progressive thing to do, but in fact, it was take, it was removing a confidentiality screen that uh, has been, that was really important. Um, and as a matter of sort of workflow, the same people are gonna deal with it. It's gonna be kicked over to the diversion staff to deal with it, so it's not really changing workflow all that much, um, but it's just giving back this confidentiality protection. We're gonna break until 10.30, and thank you very much, David. So when we come back to this, we'll look at some different ways to deal with the suspension and issue as well as the juvenile uh, delinquency statutes for marijuana possession. Do you mean come back again? No, no, next, next time gotcha. we take this bill up. Because okay. um, there's something else to Yeah, <coughs> Lynn has okay. amendments. I think there's a couple of things. Senator Ballin, thank you for being with Oh, thank you. Being so patient, waiting well, for us to get together well um, I appreciate the time I know you have a lot on your plate we do this year for some reason. so I thought what I would do is just talk about the origin of the bill tell you sure. why um, I was um, interested in introducing it and then um, Becky Wasserman and Aaron Jacobson and I have talked quite a bit about it so Becky can take you through all the, the bits uh, but um, I'll just say that I met Aaron Jacobson um, at a meeting this fall concerning various access to justice issues, <laughs> and Jacobson is the lead project attorney and project coordinator of the South Royalton Law Clinic's uh, Vermont Immigration Assistance Project. And we got to talking about what were relatively simple and straightforward uh, pieces of legislation that could really help juvenile immigrants in Vermont. Uh, one's, uh, Legislation that would not, we don't think, take a very heavy lift and wouldn't get bogged down, but could make a really clear, positive difference in the lives of immigrant juveniles and their um, ability to seek relief and protection from the courts. So it's a narrow bill. It's limited to immigrant kids who have been abused, neglected, or abandoned, because these kids are essentially in a legal no man's land. Their parents can't take care of them, and they can't go back to their home countries. So the main thrust of the bill, and again, I'm gonna to defer to the lawyer in the room, Becky, but as I understand it, the main thrust of the bill is really to codify and statute a decision that was handed down by the Vermont Supreme Court last summer, which was Kito Kitoko versus Salomo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, which was a unanimous decision by the court about special status. So courts have the ability to issue special findings as they relate to juvenile special immigration status. And they have the authority and the charge to ensure the best interests of children in Vermont, whether they're immigrants or whether they're native born. Um, and Aaron Jacobson has personally dealt with about 10 of these cases in the past year. And I spoke with her again this morning and she said more and more cases are coming to the clinic um, every month. So, 
really the main thrust of the bill is to clarify the law on how juvenile immigrants can get relief and protection and it's a rather small but important step in protecting um, these immigrant juveniles through giving them <coughs> special status in the courts. So that's just, just wanted to frame it for you in that way. Um, I know that Sorokin is desperate to have me get back to committee. So I will I'll certainly answer any questions you have, but Becky really is the, the legal expert on this. And um, okay. just really appreciate the time. So who should we hear from besides Mary Jacobs? Um, she is happy to come and testify, and she has a list of, of people. She can be our, our point of, of contact on this. Um, does that work, or how, how best to do this, Senator? Well, Peggy would have to contact her. Yeah. If you can just let Peggy know. Absolutely. And Senator White. Who would oppose it? She didn't think anyone would because, at least this provision of the bill, there are several provisions, and one deals with um, including immigrant status in protection of um, hate crime legislation, essentially. So that piece may be more controversial, but in terms of the two pieces dealing with special immigration status, she didn't think anyone would because these cases are already coming. They already have a decision from the Supreme Court saying that there is a legal path. So she is an optimist by nature, as I am, so it's important. I will ask her those questions again of who, who needs to, to be heard on the other side. Okay. So. Thank you. Our Supreme Court? Yes, our Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court. Not federal. No, our Supreme Court. Okay. That's Again, thank helpful. you so much. You. Really appreciate it. Becky, take it away. And I'll circle back with you later, Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Becky Washington. Senator Nicker is speaking to her plumber. <laughs> it's important. I had I had a toilet leak in the other week. <laughs> there are toilets need to work. Here. Yes. <laughs> um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Uh, so this bill is relating to the special immigration juvenile status, and just as an overview, this is um, sort of a form of protection under federal law that's given to immigrant children. Um, that are, uh, there has to be some criteria, but they would be under the jurisdiction of a state uh, juvenile court. Um, they can't be reunified with one or both of their parents due to abuse, abandonment, or neglect. And then there's other criteria such as uh, it has to be in the best interest of the child and that they are found to not be able to go home to their country. Are these children who've been adopted? Adoption is one of the ways that you can be sort of subject to the state juvenile court system um, and be eligible for it. A family adopts a child from Russia and then uh, things don't work out. Do they unadopt them or are they given the state's custody? Or, or? Um, if they, yeah, if they're under, the, the <coughs> federal law says that they have to um, be under the jurisdiction of juvenile court, so that that's defined as a court <coughs> located in the U.S. having jurisdiction under state law to make judicial determinations about the custody and care of juveniles. So in, in our state, that is could either be probate division or family division because you can have children under guardianship. I'm confused about the immigrant st immigration status because my understanding was if you adopt, if you're, you know, my next door neighbor <coughs> adopted one from Haiti, one from Miami, both persons of color. And the one from Haiti, my understanding is, is now a U.S. citizen because they were adopted by this couple. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, so who are, I hate to say who are these people, but who are the kids who are still immigrants but have um. not? See, I would assume that once you're adopted by a U.S. couple, you are now an American not citizen. Not automatically, no. no. I don't think automatically. No, no. Um, you have to go through. I found. Let me see. So the child from Haiti would need to go through. Certain it depends. You know, were they adopted in Haiti or were they adopted when they got here? So a lot of it's, don't it's know. different with different countries. But the and I haven't done this work in quite a while. But it used to be that um, you would file for citizenship for your child. For your adopted child, oh. and then you go through. So it's not like you children. had. It's really weird. You Doesn't it isn't automatic when you um, 
adopt somebody so on the day of adoption. But if you're a mother who comes to comes to the United States, gives birth to a child, that child is an American. Yes. But if you're adopting a child, they're not an American. Right. That's really weird. Well, and how, how about there's another category of children who come to this country to be adopted and then they get kicked out of the adoptive family. So right. they're, they're in custody. So does this address them? Yeah, so it's, it's any child that is under the jurisdiction of a juvenile court. No. So oh, in the good. case of adoption, the non-parent caretaker, um, because, because the court is placing that, oh, that child that under the guardianship, they are then under the jurisdiction. There's sure quite a few of them. Status. Well, it depends whether they did go through an adoption within the family that adopted. I just it bothers me. Well, immigration has its own rules, which are probably getting tighter and tighter. That's, that's weird. I'm, I can be from Honduras. Yeah. Come to Vermont, have the child. That child is now an American citizen. But if I adopt an Honduran child and you know, go through the adoption process, that child would have to go through their own process of becoming an American citizen. Right. There's a sec there always has been a second step for them. I, I, and as I say, I haven't been in the business in a while. So. Yeah, I actually, I've never dealt with adoption cases for um, non-U.S. citizens, well, but I, I, I don't, it's not an automatic that you okay. get U.S. citizenship. And, yeah, and this, yeah. is, this is giving children um, lawful, permanent status. So who, who are in, a, in the court, through a court in the custody of some agency, is that right? Um, yeah, so it can be through, they, they have to be sort of in the juvenile court system, so that can be through like foster that's care, great. guardianship, that's adoption. Great. That's great. The bill. You know, sure. That's, that's a, I have an exact example of that. A, a boy who was a very smart kid, came from, a, I think he came from Ethiopia, the family adopted several children, probably too many because a lot of the adoptions didn't work out. Anyway, he came into custody of the Department of Social Services and he then went on, you know, and lived in a foster family, um, you know, till into college age. He went to college. <coughs> he, he had never been adopted legally by that family, even though they brought him in and were living with him. And so he had to drop out of college under the federal law because he was not entitled to be there. He was a non-citizen and he got kicked out. And then his papers were so screwed up that he you know, couldn't just rise, get everything legally to rise above the situation. So I think he's still roaming around without citizenship. It's a while since I've seen him. He may be okay now, but there are a lot of those little issues that are <clears throat> kind of there. When Becca was here, she said that um, <coughs> this woman at the Vermont Law School dealt with 10 of them just this year, in 10 Vermont. of these situations in Vermont, and that they're increasing, the number is increasing. And why aren't they, in other words, these are children who were removed from the original family for that some intended reason, to adopt them? For some reason, and we could hear from Erin, yeah. is that her name? Erin Jacobson, About yeah. the exact circumstances, but yeah. it's, yeah. It happens a lot. Yeah. They, they, you know, children are brought in with whom they really have been through maybe some terrible experiences and are, you know, impacted for life by some mm -hmm. of them, and then they, they can't fit into a normal family, yeah. you know, they need extra work. So this sort of federal <laughs> remedy is yeah. unique in that in order to file the petition with USCIS, you have to have a state court order making these determinations. Mm -hmm. So what this bill is, is doing is ex extending the jurisdiction to our state courts mm -hmm. that deal with um, that fall under the federal definition of juvenile court in this situation um, to allow for them to make these, uh, these uh, special immigration juvenile status determinations such that um, a child can file a petition. Um, and just before I get to it, the law is extended to those who are um, between 18 and 21. So that is why there's um, an additional section related to the probate division to allow for guardianship for those over 18 in this specific situation because otherwise children or 
I guess adults, children, 18 or older would not qualify um, for guardianship to allow these determinations under current law. Um, so that is another change that is being made in this bill. Yes, it's um, under the Immigration and Nationality Act. It allows for the special immigration status, juvenile status, and there are federal regulations that um, implement that. But one of the unique aspects of it is that it actually requires a state court order to be able to file the petition. So it allows for it, but the state court has to be able to make those determinations. Hmm. Where, right now, um, protected categories include sexual orientation, gender identity, and perceived membership in any such group. Is that <coughs> based on state law that itself is based on federal law? So that section of the bill is actually dealing with a separate topic. So. All the other sections in the bill are dealing with the special immigration juvenile status. That, that section of the bill is extending the protected categories under the um, hate crime, uh, hate motivated crime injunction chapter of law. So it's including in um, the categories of, of people that are protected immigration status. So that is related in the sense that it's dealing with immigration status, but it's not actually dealing with the well, that's special immigration. Not in the scope. That's more. That's, I don't know if that's even in this committee. Which one? We we do, or I say we we in economic development we use this to deal with protected categories. Um, but it seems like they could be taken up in a number of. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, that seems beyond the scope of the bill. I, I'm not clear as to how that got in there. That, that's, the that's in section three of the bill. Section three. Yeah, so it's adding immigration status to the definition of. Sorry, it's at the on page two, starting on line fifteen, that, yeah. mm -hmm. um, to the definition of protected category in relation to an action for a hate motivated crime injunction. Oh. oh okay. Oh. Well, then, then it would yeah. be here. It would be it's here. A hate motivated yeah. crime. So that's fine. Yeah. Not, not that I'm saying we're going to do it, but just that yeah. we can take testimony on that too. Yeah. yeah. Do you want me to start? Uh, section one? Yes, please. Sure. Okay. So section one is amending the um, jurisdiction of the family division. So it is providing, um, so if you go to line 18 on page one, it is providing for concurrent jurisdiction with the probate division to allow for these special immigration judicial determinations regarding the custody and care of children within the meaning of federal law. So it's referencing um, the Immigration and Nationality Act, as well as the um, 8 CFR section 204.11 is uh, are the regulations that implement that section of law. And um, it is issued pursuant to 14 BSA chapter 111, subchapter 14, which is the new, the new chapter that's being added in this bill. So it's essentially extending jurisdiction to the family division to allow them to make these determinations within the meeting of federal immigration law. And the federal immigration law allows us to expand that jurisdiction. Um, the f what I'm trying to get at. It's not allowing, I mean, we the, the General Assembly is able to do that. The federal immigration law is saying if you have a state court determination, um, then you can petition for the status. What I want to avoid is the federal government using this as justification to step in and say, we don't like what Vermont is doing when it becomes an issue. So we are extending the jurisdiction of our state courts immigration status, which is generally the federal government's prerogative. And I want to make sure if we're doing
doing that, it doesn't raise the red flag of ice that comes stepping in and saying, okay. we're going to attack. So it's not, this isn't making any determination about immigration status. That is, you're correct, a federal law issue. This is making a determination under state law that the child meets the requirements of being abused, abandoned, or neglected, um, and is under the jurisdiction of a state juvenile court. That part is This is doing what we already do, right? State courts do have jurisdiction yeah, yes. over the kid that's abused. Right. That's, that's, I, yes. So if the child is abused, neglected, or delinquent, they would go under DCF care anyway. So the state courts would be doing those. So this is just clarifying. Right. Yeah. So as um, Senator Ballant said, this is sort of codifying the um, case law that says that making it clear that our state courts can make these can issue these specific orders relating um, to children who, who might be petitioning for this immigration status. That petition still has to go to the federal government, and they're the ones who decide on the actual immigration status. Our state courts are just deciding on whether, you know, the child has been abused, abandoned, or ne neglected. The child cannot be re reunified with one or more parents, and the child cannot be sent home to their, their home country for whatever reasons. It has to be found to be in the best interests of the child, which is also a standard under state law. And immigration says we're allowed to do that. Why? I guess I'm Yeah, I mean, in yeah, order in sure. order to have this immigration status, you need to have this That's state court. court order. Right, got it. So I guess I'm wondering then, it's could we not do all of this with regard to the child without having them have protected status, adding them to the protected class. Because yeah, I can that, see that's, that's a different issue. issue. That's a different, different. yeah, that's but a different. Isn't it, isn't it that doing doing that would allow someone who crosses the border illegally abandons mm -hmm. their child, gets them, gets them in here? That and they section take the of the bill is not related to the, to um, the. Um, yeah, so section I, three I, is related I, to. I know, but I was wondering. OK, go ahead. Sorry. I, yeah. What was your question? Maybe I, I was wondering why do we have to have the immigration status under the protected we, category? We don't. We don't. That's, we don't. A that's, a, that's a separate. It's a two birds with one stone. It isn't oh, so that related. could be taken out and wouldn't be a problem. Right. It isn't related. I, I think that's the thing that people would question. Well, that's what Becca said when she was here is that that's the section. Okay, sorry I missed that. Okay. So yeah. take, we could take that out. And still have the protection okay. for the children. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in answer to the question, I guess, of can the courts do this, I think um, Section 5, um, which is, sorry, I'm sorry, on page 5, Section 3099 on line 5, for individuals 18 to 21 years of age, I think state law actually does need to be changed to allow for um, guardianship uh, for the probate division to appoint a guardian for uh, individuals 18 to 21 years of age um, to allow them to make these findings in connection with those persons because otherwise they wouldn't um, be allowed to have an, a guardian appointed under the law. Can I ask this a different way? If a finding is made that the child has special immigration status, does that by itself give the state court power to have a guardian appointed? So the child would not get that status, that would not be given that status until the state court order is a prerequisite to having their immigration status um, established. At the federal level? At the federal level. Yeah. So they would, in, in filling out their form. So it's not usurping the authority. It's no, setting it's. Setting up something that's subordinate to that authority, but requisite for the application. Yeah, it's a prerequisite for the application. Yeah. It's part of the documentation that they would have to submit when they petition to the federal government to make a determination about their immigration status. It is not in and of itself making any determination about immigration status. But if they're brought under the jurisdiction of the state court, 
they can then use that in the application for their federal designation. They have to under the federal law. They need that that court order. And we have a Supreme Court case. So we're, we're codifying what they just did. Kind of. S saying that they the courts can make the special right. determinations. She's a superior court judge. But she was the. She was the federal. I wonder if she would have a. I wonder some if she'd insight. be willing to have some insight. Yeah. I don't know. We could ask Judge Grierson to ask her. I didn't her. realize this was going to get this complex that you want to hear from a federal I, judge because every no, time she's we tried, judge. back when we were doing that immigration bill, no. she's a last state. session, they refused yeah. to come. Yes, I know. They were not cooperative. They were not cooperative right. with us. But she is a state judge. Yeah. She was a former federal prosecutor. Was a, yeah, 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 yeah. She was a former federal prosecutor. Federal prosecutor. So maybe. We could ask Judge Grierson to, if she couldn't well, come. I think here. maybe we're over. Play. I think we're over complicating. I think so too. Yeah. Let's just do it. Case, uh, maybe we should hear the legal clinic director will have some. Yeah, I think we should wait till we hear from her. Before we do so. Sure. You know, yeah. yeah. I, I just think this is, without, you know, this is, there, evidently there's been a court ruling that from this, this is just codifying what the Vermont Supreme Court ruled. Oh, okay. So, in sections, all except for three, right? Right, and I guess just to be very clear, this this isn't usurping federal laws, uh, the federal law in terms of um, granting immigration status. The, at the state level, all the court is doing is making factual determinations that a child is eligible for the status under under federal law, and then it goes to the and then it goes to USCIS for them to determine that they actually qualify for this immigration what status. What I think is troubling for me to understand is that these kids were brought here by someone to the United States with the idea of adopting them. I'm assuming. No, they could also. I mean, I think Aaron Jacobson could give examples. I, I'm imagining they could also be unaccompanied minors that are that have come into the United victims States, of abuse. or yeah, victims right. of abuse or trafficking. I mean, I, I think there are probably a lot of scenarios in which this would apply. Okay. No. <coughs> well, we'll. Whatever you want to continue. Sure. <laughs> um, so, page two, uh, section two, starting on line four. Um, this is doing uh, the same thing for the probate division of, of extending concurrent jurisdiction to um, the probate division that is given to the family division to be able to make these um, special immigration determinations. Um, section three, starting on line 15, yeah, this, this is a sort of separate issue of um, extending the protected, the definition of a protected category by adding immigration status. And that's relating to hate motivated crime I injunctions. Think probably should do that. Because it's only related to hate motivated crime. Right. There are other protected categories throughout law, throughout state law, um, but this is only specific to the hate, hate motivated mm -hmm. crime injunctions. <clears throat> Um, so page three, section four, this is really the, the meat of what um, these determine. Remind me in the hate crime laws, you have to know the person. No, it could be your perception. It says uh, perceived membership in any such group. So if I, you see this actually all the time in news reports where somebody attacks someone thinking they're from Mexico and they're from Pakistan, um, but it's still a hate crime. From the US. Yeah, they're not making robocalls. Right. So is that correct? Um, that the, in other words, uh, 
they don't have to be correct about the person's membership in the category. They can be acting on a perception that someone is and still be charged. I think that's correct, but I would um, yeah. defer to Thank Michelle because I think she was yeah, the I one who who um, drafted right. this. But I, I don't see where why you would. I can follow up with her on that question. Yeah. Special immigration status and section four. Okay. So um, this is. Uh, adding the new subchapter on special immigration status in Title 14. Um, so subsection A says uh, the court, and here um, we'll get to this, but in subsection D, the court is defined as both the probate division and the family division. So the court has jurisdiction under Vermont law to make uh, judicial determinations regarding the custody and care of children within the meaning of federal law. And the court is authorized to make the findings necessary to enable a child to petition USCIS for classification as a special immigrant juvenile um, pursuant to federal regulations. Subsection B um, goes through the process of the, the findings that need to be included. Um, so if an order is requested from the court, um, the court shall issue an order if there is evidence to support those findings, which may include a declaration by the child who is subject to the petition and then the order has to include all of the fi following findings. Um, first, that the child was either declared dependent of the court or legally committed to or placed under the custody of a state agency or department or an individual or entity appointed by the court. Um, and then the, the court shall indicate the date on which the dependency commitment or custody was ordered. The, the findings of also have to provide that reunification of the child with one or both of the child's parents was determined not to be viable because of abuse, neglect, abandonment, or a similar basis pursuant to Vermont law. Uh, the court shall indicate the date on which reunification was determined not to be viable. So that again is a state law determination of <clears throat> factual determination of whether the child uh, suffered abuse, neglect, or abandonment under state law. This is similar to the provisions that we have for kids to voluntarily stay in DCF custody, is it not? Um, I, I can check. I don't, I, can, I don't know the answer. I think it tracks that. Uh, there's, I'm not sure that they can stay till 21, but there's provisions that allow kids to stay in DCF custody if relatively voluntarily. It says that request right. on the consent of the person. Don't they have to be in school too, or some cooperating yeah, with school I, or something? I, yeah, there is. A we should probably check with DCF also on this bill. Okay. They have a okay. We should check. If we're going to check with DCF, though, then we should, because it's any state agency or department or an individual named by that. So it could be under corrections. It could be under DCF. It could be. Um, it isn't are, just DCF. I think those are the only two. Or somebody they, would have custody. Control. Department of Mental Health. Oh yeah, forgot about them. They could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe you check with the agency here. Yeah. Yep. For all right. <laughs> I I don't think people stay in corrections voluntarily. Do they? It doesn't say <laughs> if they want to max out. It says on line 17 at the request of or with consent of the person <coughs> under guardianship. Yeah. Line 17, which page? Page 5. Oh, well, we're not even there yet. Yeah. She's Where only on page 4. On page 4. Well, how did you? Let's move along here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so so I thought we were already on section No, five. she's on C on B on page four. Okay, I'm already to page five. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so C is that the court determines that's not in best yeah. interest of the child to determine to go back to their um, home, their previous country of nationality or country mm -hmm. of last residence. Um, and then the court can include any other additional findings that are supported by evidence. Uh, subsection C on line 14, um, this makes any information relating to a special immigration juvenile order confidential and there's also a, a public records act um, exemption that is added here. 
So it exempts from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act um, any information, um, except that the information is available for inspection by the court, the child who's subject to the proceeding, the parties, the attorneys for the parties, um, the child's counsel, and the child's guardian. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, court here is defined as both the probate division and the family division because they have concurrent jurisdiction over this issue. Now we get to my section. Right. So this other section, um, 3099, is relating to those individuals between 18 and 21 years of age. And this is just specific to the probate division because it deals with guardianship. Um, so with the consent of the person, proposed person under guardianship, so you do need the consent, um, the probate division may appoint a guardian for a person who is um, unmarried um, between 18 and 21, and federal law requires a person who is petitioning for this status to be unmarried, um, so that's why that is, is required there. Um, and then the the gar this guardianship was would be for in connection with petition for this this federal immigration status. Becky, is is that just the way it's um, the the law reads in these cases? Um, guardianship of the person of a proposed ward. So so are you petitioning for guardianship of the person of someone? Petitioning for guardianship of the person. I think that I found that in other areas of the law, but I will okay. I will double check that. It's, it's kind of a a wordy way. Yeah. I mean, it, if if that's the term of art, then it's like you're being given guardianship of their physical person, mm -hmm. but that's additional to them as a legal entity. Or I, I mean, it's it almost seems redundant. Yeah. But um, I'll I'll double check that and see okay. if there's a way I can. Uh, make it shorter. <laughs> yeah. um, so subsection B um, says that the, uh, the petition for guardianship may be filed by a parent, relative, or any other person, including the proposed person under guardianship. Subsection C says at the request of or the consent of the person under guardianship, the court may extend an existing guardianship of the person uh, past the age of 18 for this purpose. Um, so that will, uh, so if they would have maybe aged out at 18, this allows it to be extended such that they can still apply for this special immigration status. And then subsection D clarifies that this section of law does not authorize the guardian to abrogate any of the rights of the person who's obtained 18 years old that they may have as an adult, and that includes decisions regarding the person's um, medical treatment, education, or residence uh, without that person's express consent. And then... Their right to marry. Well, they, they can marry, but they just wouldn't be eligible for... Um, special immigration right. juvenile status. Can you go back to page four? Sure. <clears throat> Line 14. If the person is special immigration status at the state court level, <coughs> and the court issues findings that he won that status, <coughs> and the individual then goes to apply at the federal level for the same status. Does this say that the feds cannot have access to the prior findings? <coughs> so they, they wouldn't be able to apply at the federal <coughs> level without this determination. So they're not they're not applying for immigration status. They're just applying for the factual determinations. So this is saying that those factual determinations, in connection with the order that says yes, this child was abused or neglected, and this child can't be reunified with their parents, and this child can't go home. That information, those findings, are what's confidential. 
um, but they they wouldn't have in they wouldn't be eligible for the application at the federal level without this order from the state court. So unless you get an order from a state court in all 50 states, you cannot apply for special immigration status at the federal level? Yes, yeah, so the requirement to be eligible for special immigration juvenile status, one of the requirements is that you have a valid juvenile court order issued by a state court in the U.S. And then um, USCIS regulations say what that order has to include, and that's, uh, that is sort of analogous to what is in this bill. Okay, we're um, okay. moving right along. I just need, I don't know if we can get to this discussion, but if we do, we need to hear from Judge Gerson, we need to hear from Aaron Jacobson and others that you might suggest. I think we could do it. I, huh? I think we could do it. I don't think it's very complicated, <clears throat> except for that one section, which is not related at all. That is the only section that might hang up. raise some. Joe is yep. trouble. I well, I'm first taking my cue from Joe's trouble. <coughs> no, yeah, the first problem is I do, I'm not familiar with this area of law. What I want to avoid is an open invitation of the feds to come in and make a big stick. And I recognize that there are many people in this state that would like to be able to just fund their noses in the feds, but I don't want to raise unnecessary conflict that they can be avoided. I think this is the reverse. It's, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> the feds are telling they us. They've given permission already. Walking through this as carefully as I can. Yeah. <laughs> first blush was us trying to change federal law. Mm -hmm. When I get answers to questions that satisfy me, I'm happy to move ahead. But I want to walk through this and make sure I've got those questions answered. And that's why we're happy to have you here. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. After <laughs> <Asterisk. laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to so, the Becky, moment. you should make a copy of that for Can you help sure. me with, the, with the witness list? Sure. How to get a hold, and anybody get I, I don't think we would be successful in getting a hold of the federal Right. Anybody but we have the federal law, law, so. Can you make a copy of the legal list? Sure, I can just yeah, maybe send sure it to Becky. I, I'll send um, the federal we, law and regulations the and the decision. Yeah. Sure. And, and the federal law. law. And the federal law. She's going yeah. to get that to us. Yeah. And we're basically yeah. okay. just codifying what this right. is. My understanding is this is codifying what already is state law. I just put it in. Yes. And, and in terms of the federal level, it's not, it's not stepping on the toes of the federal government's ability to determine immigration status. It's actually being able to fulfill one of the requirements in order to be eligible for that status. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Survive that one. <laughs> now we're waiting for Brent. Now what are we doing? Waiting for Brent. We're doing this amendment to, to that would be offered on the floor. For uh, justice reinvestment? To justice reinvestment tomorrow. Um, so that oh, clarify this. it clarifies. Um, I, I, while we're waiting for Brent, I can give you the history of it. That when this, Two weeks ago or so, um, a William Wheelock escaped from Phoenix House and Bellows Falls, or Vise, um, transitional housing in. Um, he cut off his ankle bracelet. You know all the history, yeah. but because he murdered a person in my program, I got calls from members of his family, uh, of, the, of the victim's family. <coughs> who were upset that, you know, he's, he's been let out. If you look at the history, he's been let out like 15 <coughs> times on furlough and it failed each time. So it, it, it led me to wonder, you know, why we kept letting him out. That was one question. Um, and there were a lot of questions for the family, but um, one of the things that happened was 
uh, in the bill, you'll notice that there were problems getting the warrant for his arrest signed by the commissioner. And if you notice in the um, Justice Reinvestment Bill, we have that little section on the warrants that's supposed to help with that. But then when I asked the question of the um, about charging him with escape since he had cut off the ankle bracelet, had been gone for at least a week, had been in different places, threw away the cell phone, bought a new cell phone, um, and uh, they actually had, I mean, people don't realize how easy it is to find somebody who's carrying a cell phone, by the way. Um, when you buy the new one, there's video of buying the new one, so. Um, but anyway, the, then I was told that um, he uh, <coughs> could be charged with escape because we changed the law. <coughs> and I remember very specifically, I mean, this guy, this is the history. Uh, 1987, he's arrested. Um, and I've never heard of such a sentence, but he was given a 17 years to life sentence with 17 to serve and probation thereafter. So then he violated probation in 2000 and 2003. And at the third violation, he was given a new sentence of 21 years to life. In 2008, he was released on furlough, revoked in 2009, 2012, paroled to Massachusetts where he had an outstanding um, case and then returned to Vermont in 2015, 20, 2013, I mean, 2015 is released to Hartford, failure to return to jail, uh, he did it on his own. Furlough violation 2016, 2017 furlough violation, and then we had the current one. And uh, he was released on the 28th of January. So when I asked, well, you know, because when we passed that law setting up the escape, Mike Duchette had told us that they were, they wanted to, dis I understood, and I think we all did, that it was about discretion on escapes, that they didn't want to charge every person who, you know, went on, I think he used the example of the person who went out of bounds at Serenity House and then turned himself into the probation officers. And, you know, we didn't want to charge that person. <coughs> so we changed that. But then they said, well, no, you changed it completely. Yeah. You can't charge anybody yeah. on furlough with that thing. So this, I asked Bryn to prepare an amendment. She can walk us through it, but that's the justice of it. Um, this would allow us to charge somebody who, was, who had the intent of not returning. Not returning. And I, I guess the, the elements of it in this case, that obviously, uh, it'd be a case-by-case -case basis. I thought that's what we did last year. I thought that's what we did too. Is the cutting off of a bracelet considered a technical violation? Yeah, because they've had they had several of those. That I found out that that's fairly common. Not, I mean, they had three of them that Jim Baker told me about. So it wouldn't automatically be a. I, I, it's a technical violation. It's not automatic. I suppose you can be charged with. Just for Wayne State property or something. I'm just trying to figure out how this language, the person who doesn't to escape. I don't think it, it I, I don't think that in and of itself proves intent. This, this requires intent. I would, I would think that's a pretty strong indicator. Right? Well, it probably yeah, is, but it's true. true. If you do that, hey. We're taking care of some other anyway, people. Anyway, <laughs> Brendan, you want to walk us through that, and then we'll use the example of, I, I thought that the fact that he not only cut off the bracelet, but then threw the cell phone away. He clearly then, was escaping. <clears throat> and then right. was gone for several weeks, and that would right. be, you know, or, or right. at least 10 days. Right, he clearly. I think we had the example of someone, verse, verse, one case, somebody goes into town and has a beer, and they intended to come back. Versus the guy who steals the car and goes to New Hampshire. Right. Um, right. Years ago, we did. Uh, we added aggravated theft of a vehicle oh. to 
the person who, you know, versus the joyride, which is a six month misdemeanor, versus somebody who intends to keep that Mercedes forever or send it overseas. For the sea. That was at the time when they were actually sending cargo ships overseas with stolen vehicles out of Boston. Huh. I'd like to ask James that question. Not the stand. So that you can make an argument that, that cutting off the it, bracelet is Never fact. mind that. <laughs> you must have a case like that. Is it a new crime? Or it's a technical, is a technical is it a, violation. Brent, could you walk us through this? <laughs> let's let's see. Before <laughs> Senator Benning push Senator <laughs> James Pepper on the witness stand. And, and wants to get the feds here. And browbeats him. <laughs> 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 so good morning committee for the record Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about draft 1.2 um, of the amendment to S338 so if you look at page 2 um, that language in subdivision 3 subdivision 3 I think was what was added last year that provides that it's not um, a violation of the escape statute if the person was on those parole statuses or furlough statuses excuse me so the changes here are um, that we remove those cross references to the furlough statuses that we repealed um, in 338 and it specifically provides that if the person is on a furlough status pursuant to that new um, community supervision furlough status that's created in 338 or treatment furlough or uh, medical furlough um, in order to establish that the person has violated the escape statute um, there has to be a showing that the person intended to escape from furlough so um, I think that there's an argument to be made that if a person uh, cuts off their bracelet and travels to another state that that would be a showing of intent but again you, you may um, benefit from hearing from prosecutors about how how difficult that would be. But it would be on a case by case. I mean, they so would determine. Case, they, they would have to determine. It's up to the prosecutor yes. whether they wanted to prosecute the case yeah. or not. Yes. Okay. Good. I tried to connect with Eric before the hearing. I know that he worked on that last year to just get some history, but. Couldn't track him down before the hearing. So I have some notes. Uh, no, that's that's what we intended. That's whether what that's what happened or did it go right. to the house afterwards? And we have our folders. Uh, maybe it there. got changed in the house. Yeah. I don't know. Or if it just became less clear. I can go and do a little digging right now wow. if you'd like. Can you tell us what the changes on page one? Yeah. So that's at, that adds the a cross reference to the new community supervision furlough. Um, so if a person fails to return or visits another specified place as indicated by um, the department's order under either that temporary furlough status or the new. We've gone to, from 32 to like five statuses, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what, when the Springfield prison was built and the selectmen were you know, lamenting it and everything else and liking it for some of them? Do you remember they said, well, what if we're worried about escapees coming into the community? And one guy says, you know, I've got an old car. He goes, I'll leave it right at the bottom of the road with a sign on it that says, take me and have a map that sends him to Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> but people who escape from it. prison probably don't hang around. Actually, it is very same convenient mouth. to the interstate. It's very convenient to the interstate. Right there. They said, yeah. it's going to leave it right at the bottom of the road, so they'll have to see it. So there's keys inside. <laughs> take me. Probably take Massachusetts me. might send them back. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Put enough gas in it to send to Ohio. Are there any other questions for Brent? Brent, thank you very much. Reminds me of the westward uh, hoe. Oh. <laughs> is there anybody who would Burlington be willing to testify oh, on this? I'm going to buy bus that. tickets, one-way bus tickets for people. That was his whole answer to, to home come to Vermont. On short notice. No, no, out of Vermont to California. It was oh. his, uh, his answer to homelessness oh, in Burlington. Jesus. Send him to a warm, warm climate far from here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, certainly, uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, I mean, certainly we're supportive of the <laughs> amendment as drafted. Um, I think that the uh, intent 
to flee the jurisdiction was meant to be maintained in this. Uh, you know, I remember it was Commissioner Touchet who I think was testifying about the person who wants to go get a beer and watch the Super Bowl or out on furlough. Or, um, I don't think he was discussing the Wheelock case in this type of situation. Um, you know, this was related to the kind of challenge to reduce the prison population by uh, 250 people. And, you know, he had raised the idea that there are a significant amount of people that are getting, picking up new felony charges for somewhat minor uh, escapes. Um, but I think that this highlights the kind of opposite end of the spectrum for the kind of more serious escapes. Yeah. Joe is in the witness. <laughs> no. So I'm going to start with the evidence you should give about the matter now under consideration. So be the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you guide it. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong with that. You're not the bailiff as far as I know. <laughs> I, frankly, when Commissioner Touchet came to us, I understood he was looking for flexibility. Mm -hmm. This example, the Wheelock situation, came to my mind. And I'm a defense attorney, I wasn't going to push back. But the bottom line is, I think if somebody has an ankle bracelet on them, they are subject to a form of confinement. And when they decide to remove it, they are clearly expressing their intent to no longer be in that confinement. And to me, that's a perfect reason for somebody to be put back in jail as a sanction. Um, but the ASH program was to decrease a specific number, and I think that's what Commissioner Duchat was feeling at the time. I'm sympathetic with giving the commissioner the ability to have flexibility. But I think there's a legitimate argument on behalf of the state to make that a person in this situation, the Wheelock case, it's my example, you should have the ability to make the argument that they should be watched again. Um, but yeah, it seems yeah. getting there. So. Well, that's what this does, right? Yeah. 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 I, I, I remember the example he used is somebody who went to his friend's bachelor party or something or watched Super Bowl and then slept in for the next couple days right. to sleep it off and then had no intention. Of it. Oh, it's a little shakier. Huh? You might uh, get a couple of days in. Away. But it still allows to yeah, for flexibility. That. still allows flexibility, flexibility right. yeah. for the prosecutor right. not right. to charge the department right. to say, you know, we're right. Right. Yeah, yeah that's well I, I'm it's going to move this amendment. It's huh? It's I'm going to move that we amend S three thirty eight by draft one point two <coughs> amendment. Probably just to amend the one floor, so I'll just offer it as an amendment. Okay, but we can, on behalf of it. Senator White has moved to support this amendment. Um, is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? So you can do it on the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> short notice. <laughs> um, we're fortunate. Uh, we're off the record.